Welcome to the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry, and today we're visiting with the founder of Capital Institute, John Fullerton. Hey, John. Hey, good afternoon, Aaron. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Merry Christmas. Happy Merry holidays. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to you as well. Really uh, looking forward to our discussion today about regenerative economics and finance and uh, obviously a very, very important topic right now. I hope so. <laughs> yes. John Fullerton is an unconventional economist, impact investor, writer, and some have said philosopher. Building on and integrating the work of many, he is the architect of regenerative economics first conceived in his 2015 booklet called Regenerative Capitalism, How Universal Patterns and Principles Will Shape the New Economy. After a successful 20-year career on Wall Street, where he was a managing director of what he calls the old J.P. Morgan, John listened to a persistent inner voice and walked away in 2001 with no plan but many questions. A few months later, he experienced 9-11 firsthand. The questions crystallized into his life's work with the creation of the Capital Institute in 2010, where his work reflects the rising evolutionary shift in consciousness from modern age thinking to integ integral age thinking. Capital Institute is dedicated to the bold reimagination re of economics and finance in service to life. Guided by the universal patterns and principles that describe how all healthy living systems that sustain themselves in the real world actually work, the promise of regenerative economics and finance is to unlock the profound and presently unseen potential that is the source of our future prosperity and the reason for hope in our troubled times. During his Wall Street career, John managed numerous capital markets and derivatives businesses around the globe and was J.P. Morgan's Oversight Committee representative that managed the rescue of long-term capital management in 1998, and finally was Chief Investment Officer for Lab Morgan before retiring from the firm. A committed impact investor, John is the chairman of New Day Enterprises, PBC, and the co-founder of Gra Grasslands LLC. He is a board member of First Crop, the Savory Institute, and Stoneacres Farm is an advisor to numerous sustainability initiatives and is a member of the Club of Rome. John speaks internationally to public audiences and universities and writes a monthly blog, The Future of Finance. So John, welcome to the show and uh, really a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak with you. And I wanna dive right in by asking you, uh, what is regenerative economics and regenerative finance? Hmm. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, Aaron, and, and with your audience. Um, the um, uh, and, and a privilege, I should say. I think this is an idea whose time is finally coming. So it's it's a great privilege to be able to share my contribution and thinking on it. Uh, you know, the idea of uh, regenerative economics is quite simple. Um, it is that our current economic system is is um, obviously uh, fraught with problems. Uh, and most of the work we, we see trying to fix those problems are, are largely kind of incremental fixes. Um, one could say even closing the barn door after the horse has left. And, and the idea of re regenerative economics is really a departure uh, from incremental change to say, um, what if we considered the human economy as a living system and we looked to real living systems in the real world, such as your body and my body or ecosystems, and, and discern the patterns and principles that make them sustainable, and then apply those same patterns and principles to the, to the human economy, what would that teach us about the, the direction we need to move the economy? And then applying those same patterns and principles to our financial system on the assumption that the financial system actually needs to work in service of a regenerative economy. Um, so it's essentially living system science, which happens to be remarkably aligned with our indigenous wisdom, I should add, uh, applying that, that knowledge to economics as opposed to uh, accepting the, the unquestioned assumptions of economics. Yes, thank you. I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm so 
excited uh, to ask you a number of questions today because uh, it, it seems clearly that we're, we're at a stage now where our economic activity at the global scale you know, is undermining the very life support systems upon which we all depend. Mm. And so this is not a, an academic exercise. Uh, th this really is a fundamental uh, issue, challenge, and opportunity that we're facing as a species at this juncture in time. Mm. And I'm, I'm curious to ask you, you just mentioned uh, indigenous wisdom. What is, what is your view as, as an individual human being on where we stand right now as a species and, and how we got here. And, and I'm sensing there's a, a bigger kind of arc of time and history that informs some of your thinking. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm a student of that question and still, still searching, but, um, but, but I, I've come to believe, I, I, I used to, I used to think this idea was, a sort of arrogance of the present moment that, you know, we humans always think that our moment in time is the most important, blah, blah, blah. And, and so I rejected that. I resisted that. I didn't reject it. I resisted that for years. And I've slowly come to believe and, and, and believe very strongly that we are at a, a pivotal, uh, you know, epic defining moment. Uh, it's not a moment necessarily that lasts a year or three years or even 25 years. It may last longer than that. It's, it's probably started in the 60s. Um, but, but I've come to believe we're at the end of the, the modern age, uh, to put it bluntly. Uh, the modern age, with all of its great advances and progress of science and the arts um, and, and an economic design that grew in the context of the modern age, the scientific, um, uh, the, the age of science really. And uh, we've, we've reached its natural limit, just as we reached natural limits of the Middle Ages and the ancient period before that. And I'm speaking just of Western culture. Um, and there's no reason to think that history ends with the Western modern age. Uh, what was that book that someone wrote years ago, The End of History? Uh -huh. I mean, talk about an arrogant idea. So right. I, I think we're, we're in this transition. And I always like to say to people, you know, when the Enlightenment happened, the people living through that period, no one told them it was the Enlightenment. Yeah. It was probably just a very exciting, dynamic and scary time because a lot of what people thought to be true was being questioned and, and re, reassessed. And so I think we're in a, in a very exciting moment like that with very serious uh, consequences, depending on how we, how we handle it. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people talking about the integral age and, and that's probably broadly speaking, integrating our knowledge together is gonna define this next age, whatever it gets, called once the historians write the history. Um, but I do believe increasingly that we're, you know, maybe this is a sub uh, age before the integral age, but we, we either grab onto this regenerative paradigm uh, and get out of the hole we're in, or I believe we go back into another dark age. Uh, and, and, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, I actually literally mean that, but, but another dark age doesn't mean the end of humanity. Uh, it, it, we've been through a dark age before and, and there's no reason to suggest we, we couldn't go into another one. Um, but I think we're at the moment in time where we, we are gonna collectively choose whether that happens based on uh, our actions and behaviors and the way we see ourselves in the world in the next certainly in the next half century, if not the next 10 years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, what you're saying really resonates with me and my perspective. But, but I have to ask, sort of on behalf of some of my uh, you know, skeptical colleagues back in grad school when we were talking about sustainable economic development and these sorts of things, that, okay, there's been these like Malthusian, neo-Malthusian cycles right? The Club of Rome being sort of a well-known 
example of uh, one that's been uh, sort of pegged or labeled Neo-Malthusian. And uh, there's, there's a point of view that says, well, new technologies and innovations will always uh, overcome otherwise apparent limits mm. uh, to growth, right, is often the phrase that's used. And uh, I don't agree with that perspective, but I'm curious when you get those kinds of questions or that kind of pushback, uh, what do you generally say in response? Mm. Well, for sure, there there is. Um, it, it, it's actually a requirement of modernity to have that point of view, yeah. right? So it's it's embedded in the in the worldview of modernity that we will solve whatever problem comes along. And um, I, I guess what I would say is I've studied that question quite deeply, uh, much deeper than most of the folks who reject it very quickly. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like you have as well, but there's, there's, there's literally no evidence to suggest that, um, well, let me, let me even back up one step further. So you mentioned the Club of Rome and the Limits to Growth study, which has been you know, incredibly uh, influential on, on my own thinking, which won't surprise you. And um, it turns out that the Limits to Growth uh, models that were written or, or created in the 70s, 1970s, have been tested uh, many times since then. And there was a quite authoritative uh, research paper done by an Australian academic, I can't remember his name, maybe within the last five years or so. And they pretty much validated the limits to growth models, which were extremely primitive by current complexity model um, you know, comparison, they pretty much validated what their kind of steady, you know, business as usual scenario uh, suggested back in 1973 or whenever they, they published the book. So first of all, limits to growth was not wrong. It's actually remarkably prescient. And, and the reasons for that are, are quite technical and complicated, but you know, the simple example is that, yes, we have all kinds of technological progress, but we tend to use that uh, to use more energy, more space, more land, more. And so we don't capture the technological advances to address the problems that we're trying to solve. We, 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 we push ourselves to a higher living standard. And, you know, so for example, with all of the advances in the automobile, we still get 20 miles a gallon on a combustion engine, uh, even though the, the thing goes wicked fast and wicked far and with a whole bunch of technology. Um, and, and this is well documented in something called the rebound effect, which goes back to the coal age. And, um, uh, and, and, and the real killer is that even if we were to capture the efficiencies, for example, in, uh, in our energy use, that leaves us with more money. And here's where the crux of the matter comes in to a finance guy. With more money, we buy more stuff or invest more, which has a ecological footprint. So the more the techno optimists are right, the more we actually exacerbate our problem, which is that um, our, our money, our investment capital um, uh, the way we use it today uh, to grow the economy makes the problem worse. So in other words, we're, we're chasing our tail and we can never catch it. Right. So there's a, a compounding feedback loop effect in that type of system. Yeah. And compounding is an important word. The pandemic has taught us what that actually means. Um, but it is, it is a slow... Um, it's a slow but steady, um, uh, you know, impossible energy to, to confront. If you, if you have a system that is unsustainable and compounding, it, it's only a question of time. And as, as my friend um, Vincent Stanley likes to say, when, it's like when the way you go bankrupt, slowly and then quickly. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah. Well, and, and you have articulated uh, a framework that presents us an alternative pathway 
to to the trajectory that we've been on for many decades, many generations now. And I'd like to invite you, if you would, to walk us through uh, the regenerative economic framework that you've articulated. And, and if you don't mind, speak to the, the eight principles that, uh, that identify and uh, describe that framework. Sure. I, I always struggle to do this concisely. So maybe I'll just talk about a couple of them uh, as examples. But I think the, um, the first and most important idea is to recognize the limitations of modern age scientific thinking, which is this idea of the reductionist method, where we take what's complicated and, re and reduce it into pieces and parts that we can get our heads around. And in many ways, whether you're talking about our healthcare system, our education system, um, our legal system, or our economy, um, uh, they're all the result of this reductionist method, um, uh, which was the key to the scientific revolution and, and all of the, quote, progress that we've made. And, and you know, my, my colleague Peter Brown likes to say that, that economics is bankrupt. And um, it might be more accurate to say that economics is insolvent. And, and insolvency means where you have liabilities that become bigger than the assets. So I'm not one to throw out all of economics and suggest that it's all bad, um, but I am one to suggest that the, uh, the, the limitations and the flaws of our economic thinking are now so profound and so great that they outweigh um, the many considerable uh, strengths that economic thinking has. So um, if you have a bankrupt, um, way of thinking and seeing the world, you kind of have to go back to, to, to first principles. And so again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the core idea um, is to uh, assume and assert that the human economy, which after all is made up of human beings, which are by definition living systems, uh, to assert that the human economy to be sustainable needs to behave the way other living systems behave. And it turns out that the scientists who have studied living systems, um, while, while, while this is not as black and white as the law of gravity, um, it's more complex, um, but the living system scientists will concur or have concurred that there are general patterns and principles that describe the way living systems work. Like for example, the importance of uh, symbiotic win-win relationships in living systems. So for example, you know, the cells in, in every organ in our body are working in symbiotic relationship with each other and they become part of a bigger whole. They, they themselves are holes and they're part of a bigger whole called an organ, which is part of a bigger whole called, for example, the cardiovascular system, which again is part of a bigger whole called our human body. And, and our human body isn't even all of us because there's the whole consciousness and spiritual piece of it and our our self and our and our um, and our souls. So, but but the idea is that the that the the, the construct of of living systems are these right relationships where the parts add up. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and the parts work toward um, the health of the whole. Now we could talk for another hour just on that one principle. Um, there's, there's no living system scientist that would disagree with what I just said. They might say it differently. They'd probably say it better, but they wouldn't disagree with it. Uh, and by the way, there's no uh, indigenous culture in the world that would say that's wrong. They would undoubtedly say it better and more um, uh, in, in a more uh, elegant and mythical way. But the idea of, of our relationship with Mother Earth is not a new idea. Um, and, and yet, uh, if you apply that to our economic thinking, you find all kinds of examples of where we uh, operate in extractive relationships as opposed to generative or constructive relationships. And no more, nowhere more so than in Wall Street. Um, and in fact, the, the entire, and, and here's where the principles are so critical, um, we in finance, you know, the, the sustainable finance movement is largely about 
creating increased transparency um, in markets so that uh, investors can better uh, adjudicate which companies should do well and which ones shouldn't. And, and so this whole ESG movement has uh, arisen to address that very relevant need. But the problem is there's no amount of transparency that can fix a broken relationship between owners of, of big enterprises and those big enterprises. And because of the pursuit of efficient capital markets, and I'll come back to efficiency in a second, we now have, a, have an ownership model, which isn't ownership at all. It's, it's basically massive funds trading stocks, but no one actually owning big companies. Uh, and if they own them, they own an interest in them for anywhere from a nanosecond to a month to a year. Um, but unlike, say, a private company where there's an, a family that owns the business, there really isn't any relationship, much less a right relationship, between the owners of enterprise and enterprise in the most powerful institution that humans have ever created, the public corporation. So by, by getting clear on the principle of right relationship, we can see that our our entire uh, structure of, of, of corporate ownership in the biggest companies in the world is in conflict with living systems. And we can then debate whether that's terrible, not so great, not so bad, or fine. But we have to acknowledge that, that the way we've set things up is in conflict with the way living systems actually work, because there is no relationship there. Um, and, and so the idea of getting clear on principles is to identify at a root cause level where the sources of, uh, of change need to come from. Um, the other principles, I'll, I'll just mention them by name briefly and then maybe talk about one other one. Um, but the other ones are the idea of balance. Um, systems need to be in balance. Uh, the idea of, um, of place in my language, honors community in place, living systems um, exist in place. And so a human economy needs somehow to be connected to and relevant to place, both geological reality and cultural history of place. Um, you think about globalization that has run, run roughshod over that principle and no wonder that globalization turns out isn't working so well um, because it's in conflict with that principle. Uh, another principle from living systems is, is known as the edge effect. And, and you know, we hear a lot about the importance of diversity. Uh, diversity happens in living systems at the edges between different systems. So for example, where a river meets an ocean is a marsh and a marsh land is filled with uh, diversity and diversity is, is the source of life. It's also where danger exists, but, um, uh, but, but, but living systems have an abundance of life at the edges. So what does that say about a human economy and the edge between, for example, one industry and another, or the edge between the public sector and the private sector or the philanthropic sector and the public sector? Um, another principle is, um, uh, and, he, and here's one that I kind of made up in the context of human economies. I, I, in my language, it's uh, is, um, holistic wealth. So, so an economy is largely about the, uh, at least the way we've thought about it is the, the creation of wealth. And yet we've reduced that to the creation of money. We think that the purpose of the economy is to get money. Um, and uh, so this is a reminder that, that true wealth is not money. Money is a, is a human artifact, but, uh, but wealth needs to be holistically understood. Um, and then another one is, uh, again, in my language, robust circulation. This is the idea that, that an economy like a living system needs to behave like a healthy metabolism. It's not merely circular thinking, although circular flows are important. It's actually much more important to think about metabolism as needing healthy inputs. So the food into the system needs to be the right food and healthy food, not toxic food. Um, the waste going out of the system can't spoil the nest. So too much CO2 in the, in the atmosphere is in conflict with living systems principles. It can't possibly uh, be in, in alignment with a sustainable economy and, and so forth. Um, I did want to just, I, I don't know if I've, I've, I probably haven't mentioned all eight of them, but I'm, I'm it, it, you know, I don't want to 
sort of blab on here too long. You get the idea. They're all on, well, it's, on our it's, website. Yeah, it's great, John. And just to interject, you've articulated six of the eight leaving uh, two uh, remaining. One is empowered participation and one is innovative, adaptive, responsive. So I just, since we were going through them, I figured why not round it out? Yeah, put them out there. I mean, innovative, responsive, um, that's sort of a completely non-controversial one, right? I mean, I think the, uh, but, but again, the importance of small business and entrepreneurs in contrast with the importance of um, monopolies and big industrial gi- powerful giants. We, we have public policies that tend to support the monopolists because they have uh, lobbying power uh, much more than we support entrepreneurs and small businesses. This is not just a, an opinion that, wow, we should do it differently. This is saying, well, that's actually the way living systems work. So we need to do it differently. Um, and empowered participation, I'll just comment very quickly. Um, you know, this one is, is quite profound. Again, this is a description of real living systems, a quality of real living systems. And, um, and what's true about them is that all parts of that system uh, are empowered or self-empowered to participate in the health of that system. That's not just good for that part, that's good for the health of the system. So for example, I always, t- when I give talks, I say, well, if my feet are not empowered to participate in the circulation of oxygen in my body, that's terrible for my feet, but that's also terrible for me because I won't be able to walk. And if I can't walk, I can't fulfill my potential as a human being. So this gets to this whole issue of inequality. Um, Inequality is no longer simply a moral question that we can have different opinions on. It's actually a, uh, a, a, a direct threat to systemic health. And you know, all you have to do is look at what's happened in the world in the last 12 months to see that that's actually true. Um, but living systems principles would tell us that inequality that is so extreme that it disempowers the participation of the broad uh, you know, uh, populations of the world, communities of the world, to contribute to and receive benefits from the system means that systemic health is undermined and ultimately It'll hurt all parts of the system. So I think we're seeing that play out in the real world. And rather than debate whether we can afford to, you know, whether we need to do austerity or whether we can afford the debt, we need to start by saying, well, we can't afford to have uh, half of the planet disempowered from the health of the economy. That economy will not not survive. Yeah, thank you very much for for running through that. And of course, for emphasizing the critical importance of uh, the empowered participation. And and look, just because there's an ecological uh, reason behind why empowered participation is critical, that doesn't mean that there's not also a moral consideration, right? Isn't it wonderful that they're aligned? Yes, yes. So we don't yeah. have to debate the moral because, you know, for some reason, you know, I mean, obviously, I, I'm pretty confident most people that have tuned into this conversation would have a shared view on the moral question. But that isn't a shared view uh, across the world or we wouldn't be we wouldn't tolerate the current levels of inequality. And, and I, I think a lot of the people in the capitalist system that that tolerate it would really prefer it not be there. They would just argue that um, fixing it, you know, that the, the cure will be worse than, than the disease as opposed to literally thinking that this extreme inequality is, is a positive attribute. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. And that, that kind of gets at uh, a question I wanna ask you and I'll formulate it with a couple of steps here. I, by the way, just love uh, the edge effect and abundance uh, piece as one of the eight principles because it reminds me of uh, my permaculture studies some oh, yeah. uh, 20, 25 years ago, right? And that was a really important piece that Bill Mollison articulated. Um, and the robust circulation, of course, reminds me of the work uh, by our, our mutual uh, departed friend, Bernard Leotair. Uh, with his book, uh, Future of Money. And I, I want to chat about that in a few minutes. Mm. Um, but as you were describing the metabolism metaphor for this robust circulation requirement, it made me think that the 
the hyper accumulation of financial resources might be very much like the hyper accumulation of toxins in a body or an ecosystem. Yeah. And I, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you to riff on that for a little bit. Yeah. So uh, I, I mean, you introduced a couple of thoughts, you know, key thoughts. One is that, um, first of all, I should say these are not, these eight are not the kind of correct answer. They're, they're a map. And um, as, as Nora Bateson reminded me recently, the map is not the territory, which is a famous expression that goes back, uh, I forget to, to who, who wrote that, but they're, they're a map that is useful to me. It's, it's proven to be useful to others, but it doesn't mean that it's correct and, and an accurate map. It's a, it's, a, um, it's a tool that can be used for our collective learning. Um, and secondly, it's not linear that, you know, we're dealing with a complex system. So it's not like, well, let's go with principle number one, check principle number two, check. They all interrelate together. So um, the, the, um, uh, the idea of wealth accumulation being in conflict with circulation is also in conflict with imbalance. It's also in conflict with um, uh, empower or rather, um, uh, on our community in place, because if all the money is sitting in an account on Wall Street, it's obviously not circulating out into the, the capillaries of the system. So um, the, the, the massive accumulation of wealth in a very few hands is probably in conflict with all eight principles if we really uh, thought through it. But, um, you know, the, the term narcosis, I think I'm saying it correctly, where, you, you know, blood clots, um, what, you know, whether it's toxins building up uh, we could have an interesting debate about whether money is, is a toxin. <laughs> I think, I think it's, it's probably a both end. You know, money used in a, um, in a constructive way is a very valuable yeah. tool, but money used either inappropriately or, um, or just sitting uh, is actually, um, you know, it's, it's in violation of the circulation requirement. So yeah, I mean, and, and people have understood this for a long time, right? I mean, the, the whole idea of the Georgist uh, economics idea of, of taxing land speculation was so that people wouldn't hoard land and, and take it out of the constructive use of a broad number of people. Um, and so, you know, a, a lot of these ideas are actually just reminding us of what we've always known, but have seemed to have forgotten in the current late modern age context, um, which seems like it's inevitably true, but isn't necessarily uh, inevitably true and, and hasn't always been true. Um, but, but I think, you know, um, Wes Jackson once said that, you know, we have to keep money out of carbon trouble. And, and what he meant by that, and here's sort of tying money to your toxin idea, if, if we're honest, when, when individuals or institutions have a lot of money, they tend to use more carbon or they tend to burn more carbon. Um, now it's not intentional, uh, it's just that if it's an individual, their lifestyle, if it's an institution, their ambitions tend to be energy intensive. And when we have a fossil fuel based energy system, that means they're carbon burning carbon intensive. Um, so in a sense, money is toxic. And, um, and you know, if, if you're a super wealthy individual and you're flying around on your private jet to go to dinner and you're having a yacht parked in two parts of the world, you know, you're burning a lot of carbon. And, um, and so, yeah, it is, it is toxic, but it's also toxic because it's, it's taking that money out of circulation where it's desperately needed uh, for the health of the whole system. Uh, it's really interesting. It reminds me of uh, the way sugar works in a body that has cancer. Uh, yeah. Right. In that respect, it, it, it's sort of accelerating the damage. Exactly. Exactly. The, the principle of right relationship uh, seems to be so fundamentally important. And uh, you and I, it seems, both have some connection to indigenous wisdom. And that's part of my personal um, ethnic heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Mohawk Indian up uh, not too far from where you're located right now. Yeah. And the deep original instructions of so many of the indigenous cultures around the world 
stress this right relationship as fundamental. And uh, in prayer and ceremony, we acknowledge our, all our relations, meaning the water, the insects, the animals, mm -hmm. the winged ones, etc., and all the humans. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, how do we think about, you know, getting now from the, the what that you've articulated into the how, how do we go about helping to transform the psycho-spiritual alignment of millions of human beings who have grown up essentially steeped in this uh, neoliberal market uh, mythology or, or religious uh, ideology. Uh, how do we transform that? Mm. Well, if I was, uh, if I had an answer to that, or if I was any good at what I do, I, I would, uh, we would have fixed it by now. Um, but um, I guess, I guess, a couple thoughts come to mind and I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a good answer. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm holding that question and wrestling with that question literally every day of my life. Um, I'm a, I'm a big believer in the power of story. Uh, again, not a new idea, but um, humans appear to have always learned and evolved through story, not through analysis and facts and figures. So, um, this isn't to say, suggest that the academic rigor underlining this is not critical, because I think it is, because we generally need to be roughly right rather than, rather than not, but, um, but then it needs to be translated in, into story. Um, and, and that's the reason we've, you know, the first thing we did at Capital Institute, the first project we did was a series of stories, a storytelling project. It's called The Field Guide to Investing in a Regenerative Economy, and it was essentially seeing the regenerative economy emergent in the real world, even though the practitioners running these projects didn't think of it that way, um, which is fascinating to me because what that tells me is that regenerative economy is already happening. It's just we don't see it as that, and therefore we see it as a nice project that someone's doing something good. But if you use the, the eight principles and look at it, you suddenly see the pattern appearing in everything from organic farms to permaculture to uh, uh, projects on, the, on, there's an amazing project on an island in, off Newfoundland called Fago Island, um, to uh, initiatives in Costa Rica, to initiatives in South Africa. Um, and, and if you see things through the regenerative lens, you see kind of a universal pattern appearing, even though it's unique in every context. Um, just like every snowflake is unique, but every snowflake looks like a snowflake. So um, I believe that, that the, uh, the pressures of the current system are so great now that it's forcing this shift. So in a sense, it's less about what's your theory of change? How are we going to affect this? We, you know, Aaron and John, because we think we're so smart, we're going to have a plan and we're going to implement our plan. Uh, it's more um, uh, nudging and helping coax uh, the system to evolve in a direction that it wants to evolve. I, I, and this gets a little bit um, uh, maybe spiritual, but I, I believe the system doesn't want to collapse into a new dark age. Um, and there are plenty of forces that are leaning it toward that. But the greater those forces uh, appear and the, and the greater pressure that results, the more the pressure uh, enables us to, to solve and find our new, a new path. And, and you know, what the system scientists tell you about a, a system is that whether it's a living system or any system, it only changes in response to pressure. So if you put a pot of water on the stove, it sits there until you turn up the heat. And then it starts to get warm. And, and then if you have a top on that's glued on and won't move, it'll blow up and collapse. But if the top isn't on, it'll eventually boil. And, but it only in response to pressure. So, you know, I think the, um, I think the how is, well, I think a couple things about the shift from the what to the how. The first thing is to recognize that the what is very different than the goals. Um, or in my mind, the goals are the what. 
and and principles are the how. Um, so whether it's SDGs or planetary boundaries or stay inside the donut, these are all very useful goals that define where we need to be, but they don't tell us how to get there other than, you know, stop doing this and start doing that. Um, but those are, if you start doing this and stop doing that, you're really responding to symptoms. You don't have a self-organizing system that doesn't create those problems in the first place. And, and I believe, and you know, I, I, I run around talking about principles like I'm blue in the teeth and, and I just have this instinctive, um, it's almost, well, it's an instinctive belief that if we don't pause and get clear on first principles, we will be running around chasing symptoms until we collapse. And only by getting clear on first principles do we actually enable ourselves to identify which direction um, we need to go and what we need to address. And there's, a, there's another, another truth, truism about systems is that they're only as good as the weakest link. So if we have eight principles or if we have 10 or if we have six, and, and we figure out which ones we're most violently in conflict with uh, and, and use our reduction and reductionist reasoning, which is a useful skill to have, to figure out which one of those is going to hurt us the most, the quickest, then we know what to do. Um, but if we don't get clear on the principles, we're likely to spend 20 years fixing a symptom that isn't really the root cause of the problem. Um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm blabbing along here again, but I, I take great comfort in the, um, in my awareness of the emerging uh, regenerative actions that are happening organically, not because someone organized it in, in central office and is now rolling it out and scaling it out like a solution to a problem, but because it's, it's, it's happening in an organic way in response to these pressures. And, and so the real question is, is can we accelerate that process? Um, and can we enhance that learning uh, that we need to do together? And, um, and so that leads you in a very different direction than how do we scale out this solution? It leads you into you know, using networks to connect people, shared learning, shared stories, and, um, and in a sense, getting out of the way of trying to solve the problem as a arrogant, egotistical human. Yeah. Something like that. Very interesting. Very interesting, John. And, you know, I, I, I have to ask you a question that comes from my personal experience. Just over the last couple of months, a friend reached out to me who is in the finance realm and who's doing some really beautiful projects in uh, sustainable food and so on. And he said, hey, we're launching a $50 million fund to invest in regenerative agriculture technologies and systems. And on one level, I thought to myself, oh, beautiful. Let's, yeah. let's bring some resources. Let's bring, you know, some sugar into that ecosystem. But then I had this other reaction was, that was like, well, wait a minute. How do we know that the way you're going to make, you know, presumably 10 plus or minus investments uh, are, are, is going to be in such a manner that it's actually helping to reinforce things like empowered participation, robust circulation, the balance that you're speaking to, um, right? Because a lot of the traditional you know, sort of venture capital and um, private equity models don't yet have that baked in. There's a lot of wonderful innovative work happening with B corporations. And I think the social enterprise movement is super exciting, but mm -hmm. that essentially requires, it seems primarily leadership from the privately owned and not necessarily venture backed uh, uh, enterprises. So I'm just curious when, when getting down into kind of the, the weeds and the nuts and bolts of allocating capital toward good innovations, how, how do we go about funding, financing, and scaling those things, you know, in such a manner that we're not just, you know, creating the next Amazon? And I, I hate to say it, and it's not to knock, you know, Bezos or Amazon per se, but a lot of my pals in finance who might even also be very conversant in regenerative principles are also thinking, how do I get to be the next Jeff Bezos, mm. right? 
Well, I have to challenge you on one thing. I doubt many of your pals in finance are very uh, articulate in regenerative principles. <laughs> uh, more, more so than some. You know, I know. <laughs> really? Okay. Well, the arena, so. So, so this is hard, uh, really hard. And, and I think uh, I sort of view my uh, calling is to um, work in this tension between finance ideology that I do understand, I get it. You know, no one can tell me I'm, you know, some tree hugger and I don't get how Wall Street works. So it's sort of like a burden that I carry. Um, and, um, and yet I have this clarity increasingly of where we need to be. And, um, uh, and, and, and it's, you know, where, where, where the rubber meets the road is where in, in a, in a capitalist system like the one we live in is how investment capital is deployed and, and then how the enterprises that it's deployed in are managed. Um, and the truth is that usually lots of well-intended enterprises end up being extractive due to the demands of capital. And you, know, you, you only need to look at Google and Facebook to see uh, how that happens. Um, and in fact, you know, if we, if we followed the eight principles, we would conclude that an advertising business model is in conflict with the principles. So it, it shouldn't be, uh, you know, I would go so far as to say that, that it basically shouldn't be allowed to exist um, uh, because it's toxic. And, and how we would get there is hard and complicated, but, um, but to tell a, you know, an investor who sees most of the home runs of the last 10 years uh, created through an eyeball advertising extraction business model that that's not okay is not going to be well received. Um, and and yet, you know, I, I, I mean, it's, it's funny, I was just rereading uh, the, the parable of the cave and it, it makes me feel like, you know, like Plato was right. It's like we're all in this cave and we don't see the reality. And right. we keep playing our game, but we're missing Interpreting shadows, right? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, and so, you know, I think, I think it's very possible to invest in regenerative agriculture in a way that is truly regenerative. I've done it uh, personally. Um, I created a company with um, the Savory Institute called Grasslands and, and Grasslands to this day is, is regenerating large landscapes and uh, and making money in the process. Um, that the key, the, the only reason to remain hopeful that this is doable, as opposed to the greed and power of finance will never allow this to happen, is and this is really important. the The whole idea of regeneration is that it unlocks potential, mm -hmm. right? So whether it's your potential as a human being. Uh, you know, if you take someone and, and, and take them off of an assembly line job that is, they're just a cog in the wheel and allow them to express their true genius, their true essence, they, they contribute and, and create, you know, enormously more than they ever could as a cog in a wheel. Yeah. And, and that's true. That's the regenerative potential in, in real life happening. And so the, the hypothesis is that if we align our economies with these living systems principles, which happen to be aligned with our indigenous wisdom, that we will unlock potential that we don't see today. And we need that potential as our new source of prosperity, since the old game of extractive exponential growth on a finite planet has run its course. And so if that potential is real, that means investors, if they invest in the right stuff, like regenerative agriculture, can actually realize attractive financial returns in the process because they're unlocking potential. And if you build soil uh, in agriculture as opposed to destroy soil, if our policies are anywhere near reasonable, that will actually create not only ecological value and social value for the farming family, but financial value for the, uh, for the investors. Um, but it's a, it's a much narrower pipeline to direct capital into which means a lot of capital is in stuff that is causing damage, which means a lot of capital should be divested from a lot of things that are causing damage and, and invested in things that are uh, truly regenerative. And the truth is 
a lot of those things are going to be social enterprises or, um, you know, in our current framework, philanthropic, because we've essentially extracted for, for centuries from natural capital and social capital. And so there's this massive imbalance. And we know that balance is a living system principle. So we need to invest in living system ecologies and social systems. And that's going to mean, you know, an order of magnitude different um, philanthropic allocation or recirculation of money into things that don't all generate um, financial returns, but many of them will. Yeah. We just need to be much more discreet about how we allocate capital. Well, let me ask this, you know, um, my friend uh, Eric Lombardi was on a recent episode talking about the work he and his colleagues are doing in the social enterprise movement globally. And of course, our mutual friend Woody Tash has been doing a lot of wonderful work in the slow money movement where communities uh, have deployed tens of millions of dollars uh, in 0% uh, interest rate loans to local farmers and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, in the social enterprise model, to be designated a social enterprise, the business necessarily has to give at least 50% of its profits to uh, nonprofit and, and, and social and environmental work. Uh, do you see that uh, from the investor perspective, uh, investing in regenerative enterprises necessarily means you're going to see yields, profits, returns that are lower than some of the other extractive uh, yield potential out there? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, I think, I think we can't sugarcoat it. If, 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 if our, you know, if our expected financial returns that we've gotten used to, so, so here's how it's, it's the, the, the averages and the generalizations actually get you into trouble, right? Yeah. So, um, it, it is true that a lot of the current capitalist system is extractive, uh, both of natural capital, whether it's the environment or polluting rivers, uh, sorry, whether it's the atmosphere that we're polluting or rivers we're polluting, or simply cutting down forests and, and turning grasslands into, into cornfields. It is by definition extractive and there's a profit in that. And if we can't do that anymore, um, and that's very profitable, all else equal, the economic system will be less profitable and returns on capital will be lower. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, only extractive activities generate high returns on, on investment. And you know, a, 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 a great example, um, in fact, I'm doing a little research on this now, but you know, not every company goes the, 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 the direction of Amazon or Facebook that is massively successful. You know, there's a great little company, it's not little anymore in Canada called Shopify, which essentially provides the backend engine of a lot of uh, e-commerce. And, you know, I'm sure it's not perfect, but you could argue, you know, you could say, well, it's enhancing consumerism and that's a problem. Well, that's probably true, but, but if it's displacing, you know, Walmart consumerism with small businesses that are, uh, circulating money in their communities, then I would argue it is a positive. But but what Shopify is doing is it's essentially making the you know the non-critical activities of that small business easy by by doing it in you know sort of in a kit on the web. And so I can order my my wool that comes from a, a holistically managed ranch in Argentina that goes through a small company that, that then fulfills the order on Shopify. And Shopify makes money, the company solves the problem. And, um, and so if I invest in Shopify, which I happen to be an investor in, I can feel good about their success. Yeah. Um, and if, if they were to, to you know, convert and start using an advertising business model rather than a fee, a transaction business model, yeah. then I'd have to reassess that. Um, but there's no reason to think that investors can't earn extraordinary returns from innovative uh, businesses. I mean, look at anyone who owns Tesla stock, you know, don't get me started on that. It's insane, but they've done just, they've done just fine. And that's been a critical innovation. It's no matter what you think of Elon Musk, um, you know, he, is, he has done something that no government was ever going to do, which is to, you know, dream the impossible and, and, and make it a reality. 
Um, that's, that's regeneration happening in real time. Now, whether that company is governed the right way and blah, blah, you know, we could debate it for a long time. Um, but at um, any rate, I, 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 think, I think the devil's in the details at the end of the day. And we need to um, create many, many more regenerative projects and then educate capital to finance them. And, and social enterprises will be a piece of it. You know, the beauty of Woody Tash's vision is that it's all happening in place. And so it's, it's amplifying that one principle and it's democratizing the flow of capital into little small projects or in, you know, you know, the, the way we're going to solve this is not by writing trillion dollar checks at a time. It's going to, it's going to be by uh, a much more diversified and uh, decentralized uh, set of solutions. So not that slow money is the solution, but it's a, it's an example of regenerative economy emergent in, in the real world, even though Woody doesn't use, or at least didn't used to use the phrase regenerative, certainly not when he started it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, John. It's uh, wonderful hearing your, your feedback and perspective on those topics. Let me uh, remind our audience that this is the Why on Earth Community Podcast. And I am your host, Aaron William Perry. Today, we're visiting with John Fullerton, the founder of Capital Institute. And you can connect uh, with John and his team and his work at capitalinstitute.org. There are a handful of great uh, white papers and resources, including one called Regenerative Capitalism, another called Finance for a Regenerative World. I'll include links in the show notes, of course. Um, and you can uh, also find the Capital Institute on Facebook under the name Capital Institute. On Twitter, it's Cap Institute. And on LinkedIn, it's Capital-Institute. Uh, you can also find John himself on LinkedIn. And that handle has lots of random letters and numbers. So I'll just include that in the show notes. I'd like to thank our uh, sponsors and partners. And one of the things we're uh, now experimenting with at the Why on Earth community is a Why on Earth approved ecosystem of regenerative economic relationships in which uh, we're inviting companies that are B certified or social enterprises uh, or meet those criteria uh, to share their goods and services through our network, uh, providing discounts uh, to our audience and also providing a portion of proceeds back to Why on Earth, a nonprofit. And uh, many of these are included in our list of sponsors and supporters. And that, that includes Earth Coast Productions, the Lidge Family Foundation, Alpine Botanicals, Purium, Earth Hero, Liquid Trainer, Vera Herbals, Growing Spaces, Soil Works, Earth Water Press, 1% for the Planet, Dr. Bronner's, and Waylay Waters. Of course, a huge shout out to our monthly contributors who have decided to give uh, a, a, an amount of their own choice every month. If you haven't yet joined and you'd like to, you can go to whyonearth.org and click on the donate button and get that all set up. If you want to give at the $33 or greater level per month, we'll also send you jars of the Waylay Water CBD hemp infused aromatherapy soaking salts for your own health and wellness practice. And of course, a big thanks to those folks out there in our stewardship circle uh, who are also helping to underwrite our podcast series and our community mobilization work for regeneration, climate action, neighborhood resilience, and culture of kindness. And uh, John, I, I just, my pages are full of notes here. Um, I imagine we could probably have several of these conversations and, and only then really be scratching the surface on, on this topic and set of topics, which is which is so important. And I, and I want to um, circle back to the reference to Bernard Lieter's work because he's a, a, a dear friend and I really enjoy honoring him now that he has uh, mm. transitioned to, mm. out of this life. And, uh, and my, one of my favorite books, The Future of Money, of course, presents four near-term scenarios, one being wonderful. Uh, the other is being pretty tough, troubling, if not downright horrifying. And uh, in here, you're referencing uh, uh, an item that he co-authored, and I'm just flipping to my notes here to get to it, um, called Money and Sustainability, The Missing Link. 
Uh, of course, Bernard was part of the uh, technocratic team creating the convergence mechanisms when the various national currencies in Europe uh, converted into the euro, right? So understood some of the deep systemic attributes of, of uh, currency and uh, financial capital. And when your principle of robust circulation comes to mind, it makes me think of his requirement for demurrage or negative interest in certain currency types to avoid that hyper accumulation and keep mm. things flowing. And I'm just, I'm curious, of course, we've seen strange market behavior in the last uh, eight quarters where we're experiencing negative interest rates in certain sectors. Mm. Um, but I, I'm curious, do you see those kinds of technical attributes as, as necessary across the board or as things we'll see in certain places, certain sectors? What, what do you think about this negative interest idea? Oof. You know, I don't, um, I, I do think having a, uh, well, let me, let me also first pay tribute to Bernard a little bit because he's, yeah. he, he was a, um, a brilliant mind, but also um, just a, a determined and passionate, um, you know, he, he, he was on to this idea and it wasn't popular a lot of his career and he was sort of lonely uh, in the wilderness, but stuck to his guns. And um, I, I've only had a couple of conversations with him um, before he died myself. I never met him in person. And, um, but, but what, what we shared actually, which is I thought what you were going to ask me about. So I'm sort of ducking your question right now. Good, good. Um, <laughs> he, uh, his book, um, the last one you mentioned, the one that has the word sustainability in it, yeah. his co-author is a woman named Sally Gorner, who, um, who was actually one of my teachers and was, was the science advisor for Kaplan Institute for a number of years. And in that book, uh, I discovered this, this really was an, an epiphany for me. Um, and, and Bernard uh, learned from the same uh, living system scientist, really a, um, uh, his name is um, uh, uh, Bob. Um, uh, I'm having a mental block. It'll come back to me. But at any rate, he. No sweat. Yeah, we can include it in the show notes. We'll follow yeah, up he, on that. He, through, through studying um, uh, actual living systems, empirical studies, he discovered that uh, uh, living systems have a quality that balances efficiency and resiliency. And there's this beautiful diagram that you can find on the web or in my papers that looks like an upside down U, but it's skewed toward one side a bit. And it shows that at the top of the U is what he calls, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the academic's name is Bob Yulanowitz. And Yulanowitz showed that there was this window of vitality that that said that any living system that has sustained itself balances efficiency with resiliency, but that that balance point is actually skewed toward resiliency. Mm. So it hit me like a, like a brick, right? Yeah. Economics is all about efficiency. Like the whole point of economics is to maximize efficiency. And the whole point of investment is to maximize the efficient return on capital, which means the risk adjusted return on capital. So we've got a system designed to conflict directly with one of the principles of living systems. So I generalize this into the principle of imbalance because it, it, it applies as much to efficiency and resiliency as it does to the feminine and the masculine. There's lots of things that need to be in balance. Um, but you know, we wonder why we've basically blown up the global economy um, and globalism because of this you know, very effective and endless pursuit of efficiency uh, whether it's the financial crisis, which was a collapse of, of a brittle system that became too efficient in yeah. many ways, or the long-term capital crisis 10 years earlier. And Bernard pointed this out in the context of money systems. Mm -hmm. And what few people know is that, yes, he worked on the euro, but he actually was proposing the euro as a complementary currency. Uh, and, and the politicians said, we'll go all in and give up our domestic currencies and just adopt the euro. And so now they're stuck in a rigid system and have no ability 
to, um, uh, to respond to the crisis because they, they have, they've, they've given up their own currency. So they can't appreciate a currency and adopt, adapt, adjust to the new context. Uh, so it drove him crazy, basically his whole professional life, because he invented this idea that then was misappropriated. So anyway, um, that's a long introduction to, to Bernard's uh, wisdom and, and really genius around monetary issues. But, um, but I believe, I essentially have, have taken his idea on money systems that need to be diverse to, to have uh, resiliency. And so he's been this big proponent of complementary currencies and, and extended it to the entire economy. Now, with respect to, um, you know, uh, having, having a, a policy that would essentially penalize simply hoarding money, I think it probably is a part of the solution. Mm. Uh, but, but I always hesitate to have firm ideas about money because it's so bloody complicated. Yeah. Um, uh, it, would need to be, it would need to be part of uh, a, a broader solution set. And I, I guess what I would say is I don't, I don't share Bernard and other people's view that it's all about our money system. And if only we had the right money system, um, everything would be fine. Um, because, you know, people often point to the, the fact that we have interest bearing debt as our money system, and therefore it needs to earn a return. But they're missing the point that, you know, if we only had equity investment, just because equity investments don't have a coupon, yeah. like a debt investment does, doesn't mean they don't need to earn a return. And so right. equity investors don't invest unless they expect a return, just like a debt investor. So the, the real problem is, is investment, not money. And, um, and I, I do think, I do think how we, you know, it, it's almost like investment, you know, if, if you go back to like the basics of GDP, if you say the endless growth of, G, of our of GNP or GDP is now a problem because of just from climate change alone, well, investment is a component of GDP. And so if we have to limit consumption, that means we have to limit investment or there's some trade-off between them. And um, so I, I think I think we need to rethink investment in a way that's way more profound and fundamental than than anyone is really has even begun to do. And and so, you know, demurrage on money, you know, it's a technical detail relative to a more profound, uh, you know, what do we do when there's too much investment capital on the planet? Yeah. Yeah. Say, I mean, it's another way, sorry to interrupt. It's another way of saying there's probably too many people on the planet. Yeah, you know? we have we have some big challenges. Yeah. And what are we going to do about that? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, for your reflections on that. And uh, I, I agree with you uh, in general and in principle that uh, where we're hopefully headed is not just a matter of, of technical solutions, but is very much a matter of deep cultural and, and psycho-spiritual evolution. And I was struck uh, to sort of wrap up our discussion for today, John. Um, I was struck in your paper, Finance for a Regenerative World, that you know, on page six, there's this, what looks like a, a medieval or older woodcut called the worship of Mammon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I recall from New Testament scripture, if, I'm, if my memory is serving me correctly, uh, that uh, it may have even been uh, Jesus Christ who says you cannot have two masters, you cannot serve both God and Mammon. And in a strange way, after I've been thinking about this a lot lately with the novel that I mentioned to you that I'm writing, um, but today when I saw this image reading through this paper, it struck me, by gosh, what we've done, uh, perhaps inadvertently and ironically out of a Judeo-Christian Western milieu primarily, is we have globalized the worship of mammon, uh, the, the greed money uh, impulse. And I'm not sure I'm formulating a question for you, John, but I'm just curious if we're getting into kind of the mythic level of story and articulating what's happening and what's at stake. If, in, if indeed, you know, we've created this, this global scale systemic uh, obsession or hyper focus on Mammon, what do you see as a way to heal that. And, and maybe what I'm asking is, 
how has that shown up in your own personal journey? You know, going from Wall Street into the work that you're now doing, what caused that change for you? Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a longer conversation. Um, I, I guess what I would, what I would tell you is um, it was a, it was an instinct, an instinctive calling, not a rational, logical decision. I, I had to leave. Um, I just felt I, I had been restless for years and the merger with Chase kind of gave me the excuse to walk away um, much easier. But, um, but I've, I've just felt a, um, uh, and a need to, it, it's, it's weird because when I left, I had no idea what I was searching for, literally. And, um, but I, I had this, this, this itch that I had to scratch, which essentially meant the, 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 the metaphor I, I, the only metaphor I can describe, and I've thought about this many times is it felt like, you know, you know, if you're like in a rowboat on a big long beach and it's foggy and it's sort of a little chilly and, and you just get in the boat and start rowing out. And, um, and that's what I feel like I've been called to do in and search for something that I don't know what it is. And, and along that search, I discovered the problem. It's literally that. And, and I didn't discover it because I sort of set out a PhD program to explore a question. I discovered it very much through this process of synchronicity, meaning a series of coincidences found me or, or I noticed them. And, and so the problem really found me. Um, and so it is a very kind of spiritual um, um, journey that I feel like I, I've embarked on. And, and, and I guess to answer your question, I, I, I do think this is not a technocratic problem to solve. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at the heart of this is the, the sort of going back to modern age, you know, for the modern age uh, impulse was a response or a reaction to the prior age, right? Where it was sort of this um, largely Judeo-Christian, the church is the truth and God speaks directly to the church and the church tells us all what to do and we go about our business and if we behave we go to heaven and if we don't, we go to hell. And so, you know, the scientific revolution and the whole enlightenment was a reaction to that. Yeah. And, and so we separated our science and our understanding from this whole spiritual realm, understandably. Um, but it turns out, I think it's a both end. And so we're now separated from that higher truth that has existed since the beginning of humankind, as far as I can tell. And we're, we're going to have to sort of reintegrate uh, with that. And, um, and I, think, I think most people that I know who are in this regenerative movement uh, would, would sound as if it was, a, it was some kind of a spiritual quest more than a technocratic solution to a problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Beautifully. I have to guess that I'll find that in your novel. I, I really, <laughs> I, I appreciate that, John, and uh, so appreciate you taking the time uh, to visit with me and, and, and with our Wyoners community audience today. And uh, before signing off, I just want to open the floor uh, to you. Is there anything else you'd like to say uh, to, to us, uh, to the audience, to posterity? Wow. Um, you know, I guess I would just want to end um, – uh, on, a, on a very hopeful note, I, um, you know, w one particularly at the end of 2020 can get pretty bogged down in a lot of dark reality. And, um, and I obviously don't have the answers, but I can, I can share that I, I have gone directly into that vortex of darkness myself, uh, feel I have a pretty realistic assessment of how dark it is. Um, and I see the, these events that happen, whether it's 9-11, uh, the financial crisis, now the pandemic, uh, really as lessons. We're, we're, being, we're being forced, you know, Donald Trump, um, Bernie Madoff, all these things are being forced on us to see. They're like shoved in our face so that we can no longer 
ignore them. And they all hold critical lessons. Uh, the pandemic being that we're all interconnected, um, obviously, and that my health and my freedom is connected to your health and your freedom. And so there's no such thing as my freedom in disconnected from your freedom. And, and we haven't learned these lessons yet, but the lessons are there for us to, to grasp. And so, you know, as, 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 as hard as it is and as tough as it is to deal with, um, I'm actually genuinely hopeful, not optimistic, but hopeful that um, we're actually gonna come through this uh, and, and that we're, we're learning the stuff we need to learn uh, just in time, hopefully, um, to avert what would be otherwise a very dark period ahead. And, um, and I believe that, and I live, I live my life with that belief. So I'd just like to share that uh, with everyone. And, um, and hopefully that's uh, some tonic for a tough year at the end of a very tough year. Not that next year is going to be easy, but uh, anyway, thank you, Aaron, for having me. It's been a, a wonderful conversation. Let's, let's continue it in the future. Beautiful. Thank you, John. I, I look forward to it. And uh, thanks again for visiting with us today. The Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code whyonearth, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.